my biggest takeaway again from the year was just leave room for the kids to be creative and just leave room in general to, to not be so focused on the concert, the deadline, the score, the, you know, just make music. Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Thanks to this week's new Patreon subscribers, Carolyn, Jen, and Cindy. Thanks also to my sponsor this week, Link Session Music. With me today is Teresa Hoover. How's it going? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Just yeah. uh, doing the fall. Very fun. You know this time. <laughs> I do, although I'm kind of excited that I'm not living it this year. <laughs> is that for any because of any particular characteristics of being a middle school band director in the fall? Because I know for me, I immediately, there are things about it that uh, don't happen later in the year that I, that I wish never happened. <laughs> um, gosh, that's hard. I mean, I, I loved being a middle school band director. Um, I think that there are some particular challenges this year in 2021. Yep. And in that, <laughs> that, um, that I'm okay not dealing with right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I can tell you that you are, in fact, very okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, because yeah, protective equipment is definitely one of the things. When I, when I say that, though, I'm, like, thinking in particular about, like, instrument procedures and, like, understanding routines. I just, that's important, but not what gets me excited about teaching band. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess the, some of the stuff that I loved about this time of the year, though, was, like, building that culture. Yeah. And uh -huh. and like, you know, starting to build the relationships with the kids and and just to, you know, having that, okay, what's this year going to be? And there was always some excitement around that aspect of it. So, that was always fun for this. But yeah, the um dealing with I don't know if you're doing like instrument masks and bell covers and puppy pads and like all the things. Yeah. It's Not to mention, because, like, recruiting. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, it's, okay, so it's a little stressful because we didn't get all of it on, like, in a timely way that we were expecting. Mm. So that was challenging. But the actual distribution of it is fine. The reminding them to use it correctly is a very, you know, it's like anything with middle school. You know, there are going to be some, a range of, like, how, you know, much maturity is brought to being told to do something correctly once versus <laughs> frequent <laughs> reminders. Um, but I, that's not the major, the major thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, instrument, instrument rental and recruiting are definitely more what I, what I think about, but major shout out to my um, co-director, Nicole Sobel. She just like took on the instrument rental procedure. And I was like, how dare you make me feel like I'm not doing anything. I'm th th like, thank you. And she was like, no, 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 you're doing like other things. And I'm like, I really hope you think that because I, <laughs> everyone just has their like things that are in their wheelhouse. And I see that and I'm just like, wow. Okay. Yeah. No, that's great. If you can divide and conquer, right. Let her do things that are part of her strengths. They are part of her strengths. I'm trying to figure out what I'm actually doing, but I'm, I'm Shh, cool. Don't with say that. <laughs> I'm sure there are things that she thinks that, you know, it, it probably goes both ways, but I'm just, yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely uh, one of those things. But there is an excitement in the air and I, I like, they don't know many of them what this experience is. Mm -hmm. um, if they, if they're in the eighth grade, then they did, you know, they had a taste of this. They know what the deal is, but yeah, there's just kind of, um, there, there's like a, like an openness that I can feel from my students to where they're more than ever willing to be told like what a band experience is and I have a little bit more um, control over that kind of culture and narrative than maybe I would if they had you know this is what band was last year and the year before like my teacher did it this way or this is you know the kinds of routines I'm used to it's, it's just I don't know I'm, I'm sensing from them an openness to whatever wherever I want to go with it which is great oh that's really nice good yeah very good will it be easier to like ha have the rest of this conversation if we just up front talk a little bit about what's up with you sure yeah um <laughs> can I, can just guide listeners to by the way we i think it was last so i, I think, think it was uh, august was it, was it last august a little over a year ago that you were last on 
and I think it's episode 14. I will definitely link that episode in the show notes. It's one of one of the most popular and most listened episodes of the year. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, because like, here's the thing. And I can tell, I can tell by like what kinds of blog posts also get hits on my site that like the, the ca- like category of stuff we were addressing, which is like, how do you be practical about doing instrumental performance during a pandemic and like Jamboard and like all the Google stuff that mm-hmm. is in your wheelhouse? Like all of that is... Um, as much as I, you know, also want to talk about like automation and other nerd <laughs> stuff, like the reality is that teachers are living in that kind of software. So I think right. people were hungry for it and you delivered. So, and it's a very, hey. it's a very different year for you. I don't know. I'll, here, let me give you the floor and stop talking. Okay. So yeah, when I was here last year, I was getting ready to, you know, be a middle school band director again. Um, did that last year. It was as anybody who was teaching knows, it was a challenging year for a lot of different reasons. So at the end of the school year, I decided that I wasn't going to come back this year. Um, so I, I'm, I'm officially saying that I'm taking a year off from teaching. I don't exactly know what happens at the end of the year. <laughs> In fact, I don't exactly know what happens, you know, two months from now. Um, but there's also kind of some freedom and excitement in that. So for the last like six weeks I've been traveling. I've visited a bunch of national parks. I spent some time with my sister and her family, spending some time with my mom, um, which both of them I hadn't seen in almost two years because of pandemic. Um, and at the same time, I'm able to, you know, do some more writing for my blog. I'm doing some different teacher trainings, doing some curriculum writing. We'll talk about that. And just kind of like you, you said, you know, a little bit of a portfolio career, just doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, keeping myself busy, but yet not too busy and just really enjoying the break. Um, I guess I felt when I got to June that the summer wasn't going to be enough time off (laughs) to like fully recover from everything and be able to move into a new school year fresh. So it just seemed like the best option for me was to, was to step away for a little bit. So wow. Does that, okay. does that explain it? It does. I just, it's kind of weird. This is the first time I've like said this all in public. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I, I appreciate it. I know we're going to like, it's going to become like a, it's, we're going to dance around it and yeah. you know, other topics that we're going to talk about. So I figured it might as well just make sense if you're explaining like why you're not in school to just mm-hmm. say why you're not in school. So yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well that itself could potentially be a topic. I mean, <laughs> I would so like what what all the I mean you already were doing so many things mm-hmm. outside of your existing responsibilities. Yeah. Well, and I think honestly that was a little part of it too. Um I really enjoyed the other things I was doing. I really enjoyed working with teachers and and writing and you know speaking and things like that. But then I felt like when I was putting time into those things like at night, you know, on a Wednesday evening when I was writing a blog post, I was feeling guilty about not doing schoolwork. I was like, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't like that feeling. I don't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't feel guilty about doing things that I want to be doing. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I hear that for sure. <laughs> yeah. The so. blog posting, but it's, but it's, yeah, it's fun though. I think, I mean, I think you mm-hmm. blog for the same reason I do like part of it. I mean, there's definitely like a realization that t- it can be helpful to other teachers, but I think there's also a part of it that's just like, you know, all, all of this kind of associated tasks with like, like, for, okay, like writing in of itself is, is fun. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of like taking some of this, cause like our, all of our skills go to this, to the pedagogy, you know, and the, the students benefit from it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like, if there are these, and in, in my case, like if technology is some other area I'm exploring, like I don't have really any outlet for that unless I make one for myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm not contrary to what I think some people think about me is like I'm not like some technical wizard like I can't like (laughs) pivot into code like some coding career if I wanted to I mean like it wouldn't be easy for me that's for sure so um sharing it in this sort of way where I just kind of you know just sort of having like a public mouthpiece for that information and skill that you control the output of I don't know I, I get it it's fun to do yeah yeah and it's very reflective like I'll do a project in my classroom and then I'll want to write about it but to think through the entire process. Like, okay, why did I do it that way? Was that the best way? Is there better research? Like it, it really allows me to kind of dig in even farther than I was going before, which I like. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Sometimes it also it informs the teaching. Like I'm fussing with a blog post. And I'm like, oh, this looks like 80% passable. But there's a difference between like when some when a someone just like, you know, like back when I just had a WordPress and I would just like type all text posts and write, you know, that was like 40% of what I could have been doing. And there's something, I don't know, there's when it's like 88% of the way to be in a really, really good thing that you're putting out there, it's more... The last twelve percent feels more like it's just like great on me more than when I was yeah. just haphazardly throwing text posts up on my old WordPress. So it's like, <laughs> oh, this last twelve percent. Maybe if I make the screenshots look nicer, uh, maybe if I like actually get the correct term terms of things that I'm writing about mm-hmm. accurate, and you know, you all these like little paper cuts, so to speak. Um, yeah. And then I th- I come into the band room and I'm like, oh yeah, maybe like I should be teaching at that level too. Like maybe there isn't. I can trim off that extra minute where I taught that thing mm-hmm. and spend that minute tuning a chord or something else where. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you figure out what's going to have the biggest impact right. and how you can, how you can work with that. Well, I, so that's actually an interesting statement. So like what, when you're blogging, like what is your sense of which of the topics you write about do have the biggest impact and do you get feedback on that? Like what, what drives your topic choices for the blog? Um, I mean, some of it's just what I feel like writing about, but also, yeah, it's, it's looking at what, what is getting, what's getting the most hits, what's getting searched for, what's getting retweeted on social media, things like that. Um, the things that I find the, the biggest, um, impact come from Flipgrid and Google, you know, I'll spend like days crafting this great blog post about like some very specific band thing that I did and was all excited about. And then like you mentioned before, I write a blog post about Jamboard and it goes crazy. Right. <laughs> it's like, but, but I'm one of a thousand blog posts about Jamboard, but that's still, it's something that it's, I think the fact that those tools are so, they're so tangible and they're so actionable, right? right. Like somebody can just grab a Google tool and make it work for them that day. Whereas some other things, if it, requires more preparation, more thought, more, you know, more process to it. It's, I think it's not quite as actionable, but I don't think that means it's less valuable. It just might not get as as much attention right away. Right. Yeah. No, I think some of my most valuable stuff is like ignored. And then my, this is case in point for Jamboard. I, my Jamboard post, which is just a link to your (laughs) Jamboard post is amongst maybe like the top 15 or so posts on my blog yeah. last year. Well, and that's how it is with some of the Flipgrid stuff. Like a Flipgrid article I wrote years ago is still at the top. Like, oh, I better keep updating this because, you know, Flipgrid up- updates so often. But again, that's it's something that people are using and they want to learn more about. Yeah. So it's exciting to be able to help them do that. So as you're like training or maybe like considering like what the role of like training teachers is in your future, like do you... Is that sort of, I mean, I know for me, like sometimes when I present, I, I do try to approach things a little bit more with like a, maybe like an empathy for like, what, who are the people who are coming in to, mm-hmm. and I always know that there are going to be a couple of those people who want the real like meaty stuff. That's what, you know, what I'm excited about. But I know that there's also going to be a lot of people who just are like, Hey, what are a couple of like quick and creative ways to use Soundtrap or some very, very popular, not to, not to like diminish Soundtrap, but I mean, it's just a really widely known platform that has a lot of buzz surrounding it. It's also a very good one to use, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's something that I think, you know, is going to draw a lot of people to just kind of talk about some basic practical use of that. Um, I don't know what, are, as you're, as you're thinking about this, maybe being more a part of your life, what are, how are you preparing for that? Well, yeah, I think as you just said, thinking about who's in the room in front of me. So over the summer, I taught two classes for the University of the Arts. I taught, it was Google Fundamentals for Music Educators and then Advanced Google Tools for Music Educators. And the first one was to help people prepare for the level one Google test. And the second one was to help them prepare for level two. So even just that experience of seeing what resonated with people was, was fascinating. Like little things like, um, how to organize the Google drive. (laughs) There were these massive light bulb moments. I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. (laughs) You know, or, or just little, um, tricks about resizing a Google slide. And it doesn't have to be that, uh, that standard 16 by nine, you know? So that, that kind of stuff was just fascinating. So yeah, you have to take that step back and think about what do people need? What's going to help them right then and there. So that was really neat. Um, 
And I, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm trying to think about and making sure that when I, if I am giving a presentation that I really look at the description (laughs) and make sure that I'm like actually talking about what I said I was going to, you know, if it, if it said it's going to be, you know, basic Google tools, let's, how can we cover the basics and, and give people things like more than here's how you create an email. Okay. So here we are in Gmail. You know how to create your email. Do you know how to snooze that? an incoming message? Do you know how to schedule messages? Do you know how to? So there's still pretty basic tasks with the basic Google tools, but yet it's going to be something that somebody can use. Yeah, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm looking at, I'm reordering stuff in the craft document. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Oh, wait, hold on. This is kind of technically what we're doing here. Um, So, I mean, oh yeah, this actually probably can go here. I don't know how real time this is. But, all right, hold on. Let me just say this. Shout out for anyone who, because I did a blog post about it, but I feel like teachers should know this. So we are collaborating in a craft document right now. That's where I shared the possible topics with you for today. Mm-hmm. Um, craft is is an app for the Mac, iPhone, and iPad. It's currently a year of the Pro version. It's free. There's a free tier, but the Pro version is currently free for a year for teachers and students. And so I just wanted to shout that out because this app, I like it. Okay, so you then text, you text the Google me. girl in me is like, why is it better than a Google Doc? Right. And <laughs> so, so that's my question. I'll first of all just say that part of this is just solving some some personal friction with how I, how I do this. There's a lot of moving parts to having one of these episodes, and I can automate craft better than I can a Google Doc, Google Doc. So that's step one for me is like most of the time, most of my guests just look at the Google Doc that I send out and then they don't add anything to it. So they just kind of glance at the general flow. They get the information that I share at the top of it. Well, craft is um, Google. That is, is not like the thing that it's good at is the thing that you're bringing up, which is absolutely valid, which is like, why isn't it just easier to get two people a link and then they can both start mutually typing in it. Still it, to me, it's like the one thing that makes Google docs so great. And it's crazy. No one has really figured out how to do it as well as them. Um, what I like about craft is it plays nicer with the kinds of features that are cut, like on, on the devices that I use. So Google mm-hmm. docs, so like Google is, is just Google. It's the same Google docs everywhere you use it, which is really great if you're comfortable in it. Cause no matter what your device you're holding, it feels the same. Um, but it's not going to do things like what I can do with craft, which is I have a preset template for the show notes to the episodes that automatically when I trigger the button, for my shortcut, it like sends an email to the guest. It creates a brand new craft document with all the stuff all pre-filled. I, you know, it creates a task project in my to-do list called OmniFocus with all the different steps to process the recording. Okay. So, so I, I do like that. Um, it's also, it's much more block oriented. So it's mixed. It's more about like mixing different kinds of media together. Like most people mm-hmm. treat Google Docs. I don't, I don't think you probably do more with them than most, but a Google Doc is um, going to, you know, traditionally people treat it like a word processor. So they're mm-hmm. just formatting text. Um, craft is a little bit more like mixing files, video, PDFs, text, links, code blocks. Um, it's a little bit more like sort of like an open an open playground where it sort of be, it's like um it's not going to be as good at word processing as a word processor or as good at doing tables as something like google sheets or excel right. but it is very good at being a place where you can make a pretty thing and then publish it to the web for someone to look at yeah that makes sense then. so and i i use it with my private students they all have their own little craft document that i shared a secret you can like create a secret link that only one mm-hmm. person gets and then you can create there's like little cards you can make. So within each kid's craft document are is like a list of cards separated by date. And then they can tap on a card and then it takes them out to, you know, a doc within that doc that can have mm-hmm. things like um, resources for them to cool. practice along to or, you know, lists um, to checkable to do's, the things that I want them to practice, all of that. Yeah, then I that's can really cool. It's nice. I can comment and they don't see the comments. So I can comment on things like, ooh, this was not good tonight. This needs to be, you need to check in with them next week that they can actually practice measures one through five at 80 beats per minute or something. That's awesome. I remember as a kid taking my little spiral bound notebook to piano lessons, you know, and that's where the teacher would write all the things. But how nice is this, that both you and the student have access to it anytime. 
and it's just a tappable link. I used to put it That's in the cool. notes field of my of their um, my lesson calendars in Google mm. Calendar, and they it was embedded on my website behind a pass, password protected you know a page on the site, mm. and then they would, but it was just so many steps for them to get to. Now they just have one single link that takes them to the web. That's really cool. Some people use it as a knowledge store. You can link notes to other notes. So you can like, like a little, mm. you can make little mini Wikipedias out of it. Like we're redoing some of our um, band and orchestra curriculum this year at our schools, like mm -hmm. just our own school's implementation of how we sequence things. And like, you can like link, you can create like this whole little universe of like interconnected documents by deep linking them into one another, almost like a little mini website that just lives on your computer. That's cool. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I guess I won't completely knock craft yet. I'll I'll give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> I'll play with it. <laughs> I mean, it certainly was easy enough for you to see what I was. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I I did download the app just because I was trying to figure out, you know, if what the collaborative possibilities were. But I was able to just click on it and open it in the web browser, and that was so easy. Something that um, a couple of people I know are doing with this, who are music teachers, is like make um, doing like like um, sort of putting like the syllabus or like the sequence of instruction mm -hmm. inside of these cards. So like there's one craft doc and then that sort of like links out and breaks out into other parts of the curriculum where students can get more detail. That's cool. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's it's part, part of it is just that it is a nicely, it's a thing, it's a nice Mac thing. <laughs> Which yeah. Google is not, yeah. but I can share it easily. <sighs> I know. But I will say, don't forget, you can put like a table of contents at the top of a Google Doc and and link to various parts in the document. So that's very that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> but it's not it's not as fancy as what you're talking about. But well, with with craft, this is like an, an emerging popular category of mm -hmm. software right now, because there's another one that's cross platform called Obsidian. I've heard of that, but I've, I'm not familiar. I'm trying to resist going in depth on this on this show, but it's it's kind of like a yeah, it's. You, they both use the same syntax for it as you do like a double bracket and then you just start typing the title and then mm -hmm. it kind of, if you already have a note by that title, it'll autofill it for you. And then that's a link that's to the cool. note. You're, yeah, and Obsidian cool. will show you all of your notes in a, like, a graphical mind map of like with lines linking all the different. Oh, wow. So many different things. <laughs> I know, I know. You're rewarded yeah. for using all these different tools if you know exactly where each one fits in to your work. Mm -hmm. But I feel like you're also rewarded if you stick to just a limited set of things. Like if you live all in the Google world, there are some benefits to not doing any of your work outside of the Google world. Yeah. And, and that's something that I would often tell teachers when we're working in these, you know, in these PD sessions is you have to sometimes, especially with kids, pick and choose, like just pick and choose your favorite three. Because with, if you think about with students, right? If I have four apps that I'm using with the kids in band and then they go to English and they've got four different ones and then they go to history and there's four different ones and then they go, you know, by the end of the day, these poor kids are using like 20 different apps. And when they're 12, like, when they're 12 years old, finding their shoes is hard enough, right? Yes. <laughs> so we have to, we do have to like really think with our students what we're doing. And I know that we're talking about, you know, some, some stuff that's that's not student facing necessarily, but we have to be really careful because we can easily overwhelm them. You know, a lot of people will ask me, oh, well, what's the best LMS for, for music? Whatever the rest of the school is using. Yep. Like, honestly, <laughs> because if I tell you the best one is Google Classroom, but everyone else in your school is using Canvas, you got to use Canvas. It doesn't matter because you need the kids to be able to find it in one click and not like go to Canvas and then after seven clicks be like, oh, right. Then they, you know, go somewhere else. Right. I, I totally agree. Yeah, the fewer places, the better. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. other than some musical, musically specific software like NoteFlight and Soundtrap, we're, right. we're, you know, I don't think I've ever asked a student to do anything other than a Google Doc. And Google Docs is usually, basically just like, usually a, even a fix for something else they can't share with me. Like I, I did an assignment where they were supposed to share with me a YouTube playlist in the first week of school, it's like an icebreaker. They were supposed to make mm -hmm. me a YouTube playlist of music they're listening to. And some of them were like, I can't do it because my personal account. Okay. So like I, I can, I can't make a playlist if I'm not logged in, but if I'm logged into my school account, I can't like the playlist feature doesn't work. <laughs> so right. 
I'm like, all right, just may open a Google Doc and like paste a bunch of URLs in there and then share the Google Doc URL <laughs> as the URL. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and you know, there's a lot, been a lot of changes to YouTube for under 18s, right? I need you to actually like, maybe we should just add something to the crap doc right here. I need you to like, tell me in the past year, all of the cool new Google stuff that oh, I and other teachers might have missed out on. Okay. I probably can't do that, but I can tell you that as of September 1st for under 18s, they have extremely limited access to YouTube. Um, my understanding, and this is, this is still like very new as it's happening is that kids are, can only view the videos, YouTube videos that are shared by their teacher. So if you put a, you know, post a link to a video in Canvas, my understanding is that the kids can access it. If you say, hey, go to YouTube and search for this thing, I don't think they're going to be able to. And with that, I don't think that they can create YouTube videos either. So Interesting. just think about how you use you know, how you use YouTube and really test it before using it with your kids. Um, some of it's going to depend on your school districts, how they take the admin controls, because like ultimately, you know, Google puts their limitations on it, but then whoever runs the Google admin for your district, they're going to have controls that they can, you know, flip things on and off and do this and that. So it'll really come down to what they do. But from Google's standpoint, they're saying that for under 18s, it's not a, um, it's not a platform that they should use unless the teacher is sharing it with them yeah. and it's safety right we have to remember that it's student safety and that's okay <laughs> we want students to be safe when they're on the internet but yeah but there, are, there are changes yeah okay interesting to know i don't know that we are that restrictive but i know that there definitely are some things that they cannot do mm -hmm. like the playlist feature was yeah. a surprise to me um they can arbitrarily search it as even far as, I know. as of the last two weeks they can in, unless those of them who were doing that successfully were not logged into their, which is such an easy workaround for a kid. Yes and no. Like, I don't know. I was always telling kids like, please do not log in on your school device with your personal account because everything just gets messed up. Like, as if I were to create an assignment, the kids can't open it with their personal account the way that my, my old schools, like the restrictions were. So. This is another reason I used Craft for today is because yeah. my I because of this I don't stay logged in to my Google Drive account with my personal Google Drive account and I hardly even use it for anything other than work. So, oh, because I want my whenever I open a Google Doc I want my default I want my default for it to open in my Howard County Public School account because that's most likely like it's most likely a work related thing. I don't mm -hmm. want to have to click that like switch account button every time no no you should never touch that button <laughs> but <laughs> okay so <laughs> you should have um separate chrome profiles set up is the way that so yeah i don't ever touch this, that button there's um like when you first you know turn on your computer or log in um and you're logging into a you should log into a chrome profile that's specific to howard county or you know just personal your stuff and you should have a separate chrome profile for every email address and then with that it you don't have to switch accounts so like this was part of the reason i had computer issues over the summer which is all a me issue not computer but like i typically have three separate chrome windows open one for each profile if that makes any sense can you is there any way to train a particular domain to open in a particular browser because here's the thing it's like i'm i've experimented with that kind of workflow i am only one person and if i'm mm -hmm. on my lunch break and i want to check my bank statement or something mm -hmm. like i don't want to have to open another chrome profile just to like click a link in a personal email to open it you know what i mean like that's <sighs> yeah i know what you're saying but like you shouldn't you don't want to open your bank statement on your your, your howard county Chrome profile anyways. Like, so it's when you're looking at your, your Chrome browser, it's all the way up in the right hand corner. There's like a little tiny circle and it'll either have your initial or your picture, depending on what it is, you know, how you're signed in. But if you click there, that's where you can open up another profile. And just want to, window. I know you just want it to go like that. <laughs> you're, you're giving the correct advice. I should tell people who are listening. To <laughs> it's just that I'm, I'm, I struggle with it. Cause it's like, for me, I might be trying some, 
cool new tool at night mm -hmm. on my, you know, that I got linked to from Twitter or something. And now yeah. I'm, I've, now I bookmarked it in my favorites tab and now it's the next day. And if I'm in a Chrome profile now, it's like, where's my bookmark? You know what I mean? It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. But see, I guess for me, like in my personal, in my personal profile, that's where I have Twitter. That's where I have my personal email and that's where I have any of those favorites and any of those bookmarks. So anytime I'm going to go to the bank or to Twitter or to... There's my giant dog. Nice. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> uh, so anytime I'm going to go to anything that's personal, I'm already in that window. I guess that's what I'm saying. I don't know. It's maybe it's me being a little too. <laughs> I, I get too it. OCD. It's, and it's, it's good advice. I don't mm -hmm. follow it, but it's good advice that mm -hmm. most people probably should follow. It's hard. It's hard to separate. I also do. I use yeah. Safari for a lot of my web browsing. Uh, yeah. I know. And I, and you and I've had these conversations about why, why we do what we do. <laughs> I just, I can't. Yeah. One I thing just... that's great. Yeah. It's to me, it's, well, maybe we can get it. Cause I know your new, your new computer is on my list of things to talk about. So maybe let's, let me just come back to web browsers in a second, but first just close my craft statement by saying that the reason why it's difficult is because when I go to my, when I create the show notes in, um, my personal account, then it's like separate from all of my other, you know, it's, it's basically, it's like extra steps to like change my profile. And I sometimes forget like which Google drive account is done. So I've tried gotcha. where I create it in my professional account. I'll make the show notes for the episode, link it out to a person. But even though this is just a, it's a privacy setting for our, that our admins I think have mm -hmm. set up, but even though I can share a link with someone outside of my school district, even though it was created with my own work, Google account, mm -hmm. The share settings can be set that that person is just able to open the link immediately, but without fail, every single time I get, when they click on the link prompted to basically let them into it, which mm -hmm. is, and all I have to do is in Slack, which my music team uses to communicate. I get, there's a little bot in Slack that's linked to my Google drive and it says, Hey, someone is, it's just basically prompts me with a, with a yes or a no button. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. So you think that's just something that your, your County has set up? I think so. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah, I've tried it. Um, yeah, because usually with the school districts, if you give, if you put a specific email address in, usually most school districts, it'll allow you to share it. Whereas um, a lot of school districts, if you try to give somebody a link, it will not work. You generally can't share outside of a school district with just a link. You usually have to just put the individual email addresses in. Right. Yeah, but that... again, whoever your top Google person is, they could have... Right, any right. number of ideas of how that should work and how they want to set it up. I, I totally get it. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so speaking of web browsers, so one of the other, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why, so, and I do use Chrome for, for certain things, certain things just still run better and smoother in it. But Safari is sort of my, like, you know, it's my more curated place where it's where I have like organized workspaces and mm -hmm. things like this. Um, one of the reasons why I use Chrome less than I'd like to, cause I do like Chrome, but one mm -hmm. of the things that just, just kills me is that it is like the least efficient, uh, energy user of any app on my entire <laughs> MacBook, yes. and as I have learned, <laughs> and I figured this is a good segue into you telling me about your new Mac. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I did get a new Mac in July, and I love it. It's wonderful. You I can do as many stupid things at the same time as I want, and it doesn't even flinch. You got the M. So the, you, this has the M1 chip, which is yep. like you know Apple has taken their iPad and iPhone chips and now they put them in the Mac, which mm -hmm. Apple's chips are great. So it means it basically is like an, a humongous uh, boost to battery life and performance, uh, something that you would not maybe expect from an industry that's, you know, compute personal computers have been around for 40 years now. Um, so it's mm -hmm. like, you wouldn't expect <laughs> this big of an iterative kind of like improvement to a platform that's been around so long, but all of the things I've been reading, say actually yes it is that good and you i've talked to a handful of people on the show who are we've talked more technically about the m1 chips um but you i feel like you're like i just want to know more about like everyday regular use like how it's working for you well the biggest thing for me was if i were to if i were on zoom for example let's say i was running a training um so one of the things one of the many portfolio things is i do work for note flight um running teacher trainings so mm -hmm. like i'll train teachers on how to use no flight learn. So I would have zoom open in front of me. I would have on my secondary monitor, I would have note flight. And then maybe I would even have something else on the front monitor that was also in Chrome, like 
you know, my notes or something like that. If I were trying to run that at the same time, I would immediately start hearing the computer, (laughs) which I was using the word fan. Apparently that was not the right word of what I was hearing, but it was just, it was loud. And then dare I open something else, it would slow down to the point where several times it was just kicking me out. (laughs) And I would have to completely restart the whole computer, restart my router, restart like everything to get back in again. And except I was, and at the time I was on um, um, an Air, a Mac, and it was a a relatively new one, but not an M1. Yeah. So in talking to you and some other people, they were like, oh, well, stop using Chrome. Or you you were just doing, giving me very logical fixes for it. I'm like, no, (laughs) no, I can't, you know, well, only have one window open. No, I can't do that. (laughs) Like everything you guys were saying was so logical. And it's like, I don't work that way. So what I did was a, a friend had a new a newer MacBook Air that had the M1. So she and I sat side by side and did the same things and pushed. My my computer was like the little engine that could going up the hill and hers was smooth sailing. So it's like, okay, this this makes my decision. So I got the um the 13 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 chip. Which does yeah. technically have a fan and I'm wondering, have you ever heard the fan running? No, never. And I, I, when I first got it, it, I don't remember what the, they're like, you have, you know, two weeks that you could return it. I pushed this thing. I had so many different things running at the same time, trying to make it slow down and trying to, to get frustrated with it. And I, I couldn't do it. So you just like open every app really fast that you have installed. <laughs> <I> did. <laughs> That's bad. It's like the people who, you know, test drive cars and try to go 80 or, you know. But you didn't hear the fan. You opened every app. I, I had a lot of stuff running, like as much as I could have envisioned myself using it once, and I didn't hear the fan. I, it will yeah. not be uncommon for me to have between like eight and 15 open apps mm-hmm. running at a time while I'm working. Um, again, because I'm using so many tools, um, I try to have it be like, okay, I'm using this tool, so I'm not using these tools, but inevitably I'm like, oh, I got to take a note, open the note app. So I just, I just end up leaving a lot of things running. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I don't, I, think, do I don't think Safari and messages and email Maybe email sometimes close, but like the messages app and Safari might as well not even allow me to close them because they're <laughs> always running. So, yeah. okay. So this thing is, so this thing flies. Yep. Yeah. It's like I said, it's never, it's, it's never questioned anything I've asked it to do. Wow. So again, I mean, am I the most power user? No, of course not. But at but the same a, time, a I needed something user. I am. And, and I needed something that was going to be reliable. Like, you know, last year I had my work computer, which was um, also a MacBook Pro, larger, not M1, but it was it was still a pretty heavy duty machine. So last year I had that to rely on. And then I was like, this year I'm going into a year where whatever machine I have in front of me is going to be my livelihood. <laughs> it needs to be reliable. I think right before I bought it, when I was talking to you, I was getting ready to be running the tech side of an online conference. It's like, it has to work. Yep. I can't. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I th- hopefully by the time that this episode publishes, we will have heard from Apple or we'll be really close to an announcement about like the, the you know, like basically like the higher end mm-hmm. series of MacBooks that I've been waiting for, which is like, you know, the, the ones with the, I don't know, I don't know what they're going to call the chip, but basically like the pro, the professional end versions of mm-hmm. last year's offerings. And uh, then I'm going to, my, my MacBook Pro is five and a half or so years old. And that's, I would say I've had, I've held onto a computer longer than, than that before, but this particular one has had it rough. I've taken it into, it's had to be, it's, it's been sent to Apple three times over the oh, course of wow. life. Yeah. Um, wow. And the most recent time, seems to have the is this, I have like the bad keyboard generation that's what I have the ones with mm. the, you know like where if a, a piece of dust gets under your space bar it okay. will not work so yeah I've been doing okay but yeah the battery life is I mean if I unplug it I'll get 10 minutes out of my battery oh. so you're you're ready I'm ready yeah I'm ready and so I'm excited now do you do since this machine is your livelihood do you do any interesting things to handle backup of data um no, I'm bad. Um, 99% of what I do is in Google. Yeah. Okay. So well, there's that. Um, I mean, I do have an external hard drive that I back it up to when I remember, but 
but really almost everything I do is cloud-based. Yeah. You use um, Google Photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because why not? <laughs> right. It's a good service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's trying to like looking at my my doc and trying to think about what I do that's not, you know, a, the occasional use of like GarageBand, but I, even that I use Soundtrap more often. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Okay. I want to come back to career change thing on recent ongoings. And then I want to go backwards in time to our pandemic year. And then sort of, since that was where we started our last conversation. Yes. Um, <laughs> little maybe, did we know. <laughs> little did we know we would, <laughs> you know, uh, we, so yeah, I mean, we, we might as well talk about all those things, ambitions and, and things we set out for last year, like what, what worked. But, but before that, um, I know that you have been, uh, one of the things you've been doing is writing curriculum for light the music and yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know too much about this, so I'm all ears. Yeah, so this one, I mean, I kind of fell into it, but it was it was a good thing. Um, so I met, uh, this is kind of interesting. You'll f I met Steve Van Dam through Clubhouse back in the spring. He was coming to some of the, uh, the music education rooms we were talking and just got talking more and what he was wanted to tell me about this company of his, Light the Music. Um, and essentially, I'm, I'm going to do a terrible job, job explaining it, but I'm going to—I'll do my best. You know, Steve is a musician, whereas I am like the classical Suzuki-trained piano player. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Steve was in a touring rock band, right? Right. So very different types of musical experiences. Um, but so his idea for Light the Music was: how can we teach kids music? A different way and especially going into pandemic year you know how are we going to do this virtually so we came up with this entire program of teaching kids music basically through soundtrap putting kids in in virtual bands and having them create collaboratively and and learn collaboratively this this thing we call music so he had this has this entire program um, kind of based on a game um, that he used with several different school districts last year during the pandemic and it was awesome. So what I've been helping him do now is take that program that was written to be, you know, done virtually and transition it into like lesson plans and actual things that any teacher could take right now and, and implement in their classroom. So, you know, he'll have, it'll, it'll have like, okay, here's the activity. Here's the, this I'll take that and make that into a, like a, a, what a teacher would expect to see in a lesson plan. Here are your objectives. Here are your materials. Here are the steps. Here are the, you know, this is the assessment and that kind of stuff. And it's actually been really, really fun. Um, as I said, you know, Steve and I coming from such different backgrounds and I'm still, I think, somewhat, you know, progressive as far as teaching goes and, and what I do with my students. But like, as a musician, I'm still, um, you know, I like to play the right notes at the right time. <laughs> and I want, I want to know that they're the exact right notes. <laughs> like I'm, I'm very, uh, yeah, I, I, again, I'm a classical piano player and, and, and competitive marching band and DCI, like that kind of musician. So it's been really fun having to change my, my brain into just like, how can we teach rhythm without hammering one and two and? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, it's been really fun. <laughs> So that's awesome. So look, what kinds of teachers would find this curriculum, you know, most exciting, most easy to implement? How do teachers find it? How comprehensive is it? <laughs> so there's stuff available right now online on their website um, that you can check out. It's like the music. What we're working on is so like the stuff that I'm working on is still a, a bit of a work in progress. I think the people who are going to immediately be able to use all of it with someone teaching um, either a music tech class or like a general music class music appreciation like those kind of people because they're going to immediately find it and like have the entire semester curriculum right there for them <laughs> like everything you need it's all right here but at the same time i think ensemble teachers are going to be able to, to take it and be like oh cool this is going to totally supplement what we're doing in class right now like we're learning about i i I, I will say rhythm again, like we're, we're doing this stuff with rhythm. Let's pull this lesson in and add that 
to what we're doing with that ensemble. So now the kids are also getting some music tech because they're playing around in like Soundtrap. They're playing with various tech tools. They're stretching their musicianship away from the way we typically do in ensembles. And they're getting the opportunity to create something. So, you know, it's not telling you to put away the instruments for five weeks and just do this music tech curriculum. It's going to be things that you can pull to supplement what you're already doing in your classroom. Makes a lot of sense. I have a feeling we're going to come back to that topic of students who may be in a performing background making stuff with technology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's, it's an important part of what they do. <laughs> and I will, yes. And I will certainly link, uh, link the, the website for Light the Music in the show notes to this episode. Yeah. And I can make sure I, I get you the website and all that stuff too. So, yeah. yeah I'm checking them out here. It's fun. I'm, like I said, I, I'm in. I'm enjoying being stretched in a new way, but also being able to like give my public school music educator perspective <laughs> of like, not that I can speak for all of them by any means, but I think I have a, a good idea of where many people are in their headspace right now. Right, right, totally. Yeah, when Steve and I were first talking, he's like, well, what do, what do band teachers want? I'm like, they want their kids playing instruments. <laughs> That's what they want. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they want butts and chairs, instruments and hands. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> so whatever we do has to support that. Well, and, and as I think we both learned from this past year, there are lots of things that, mm -hmm. that do support that, that aren't yeah. that, but that do support that. All right, mm -hmm. I'm going to take it in that direction if it's cool with you. Yeah. But first, I've got to tell you about this week's sponsor. Ooh. This week's sponsor is Blink Session Music. Your virtual music lessons are more than a video chat. You interact over sheet music, tabs, audio, YouTube, videos. Sound quality is more important than a chat with grandma. Using advanced settings must be easy, then what about homework, scheduling, getting paid? Everything is important, but at times require using multiple online tools that can get time consuming and complicated for both you and your student. Blink Session Music is the most advanced and easy to use software for online music lessons. Upgraded sound? Absolutely. But Blink goes way beyond to upgrade your entire online lesson experience and business operations. Are you stuck using Zoom or Skype? Then you're stuck with Screen Share. With Blink Session Music, load sheet music, tabs with MIDI, audio or videos you upload, all without Screen Share. Even assign all of your music resources as homework. Are you using a digital audio workstation or virtual mixer to stream your guitar or keyboard? No need with Blink. Stream up to three audio sources at up to 300 kilobits, mono or stereo. Plus, you can toggle noise suppression off. Blink Session Music's features go way beyond the lesson. Schedule, self-schedule, reminders, invoice, take payments, notes, files, homework, learning management, reports, and online lessons all in the same platform. Sign up now with Blink's free plan or take the plunge to a paid plan with more time and features. So I've been experimenting a little bit with Blink over... The past couple of days and i'm uh, it's, it's interesting to see this this kind of this kind of software i mean this is like for me when people always ask me like what's you know a piece of software that you don't have in your lineup that you'd be curious about and um i always say you know like more tools for private teachers <laughs> and <laughs> you know this is definitely something that as i've been exploring um you know it's it's really it's an interesting tool so basically what blink is doing is they're they've created what at first when they reached out to me seemed like uh, like a video, you know, an alternative to a video conferencing software, but what in reality is actually like a, almost like a one-stop shop for managing online lessons. Um, it's got built-in calendar invoicing, um, sharing, you know, the, the link to the lessons. Uh, the, the calendar itself is, you know, f a pretty fully featured calendar with, you know, repeat events and linking events to clients and linking clients to schools and then assigning things and um, it's almost got like a built-in sort of like, uh, in the same way that like, I will use like open broadcasting software to like mm -hmm. juggle lots of different video sources from different places. They sort of allow you to have like a, like a resource area of PDFs, files, audio, play along tracks, things you would want to use in a lesson. And then you can like pull them up and integrate them right into the mainstream without like managing all these different audio and video feeds. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've been, I've been experimenting with it a little bit and, uh, I just, you know, for something that does as much as this does I you know I think that um, it's easy for this kind of software to try to do too much and then be really clunky and like confusing and that's not at all my experience like it was super easy to get in sign up register a couple of events and students and like everything is just you know 
really like the fact that I didn't really have to like get any training to get up and running was cool. So I recommend people who need this kind of tool to check them out. There's a link in the show notes. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Are you teaching privately right now? Not right, not right now. No. Okay. It's, you see that? It, it could happen <laughs> yeah. as, as, you know, income needs to be generated or something like that. Yeah. Right. Given the last year, do you feel like you would like if you did, do you think you would consider teaching online some of these students? Like, would you teach kids out of state? Um, I mean, if I were to, yeah, if I were to potentially start soon wanting to teach private lessons, absolutely, I would teach online because one of the things that I'm kind of enjoying about my life right now is I don't have an address and I don't need one. <laughs> <laughs> so I could see total benefit in being able to teach online because I could, you know, kind of move around and travel and, and still be able to maintain, you know, maintain income, but also feel like I was still providing something meaningful and worthwhile. So yeah, it's a, we'll see. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more of it happening now. And I think it's also awesome. Like I've, you know, in, in the years done work at lots of schools where it's one tiny little school and there's no big cities or towns or for a hundred miles away. So now you're giving kids, any kids with an internet connection, the opportunity to have really great music instruction. Right. That's pretty cool. There's so much of this happening before even last year that I learned about, you know, as I was spelunking for resources. I mean, and actually one of the things I should mention that, that um, Blink Session Music does is you can actually like manage a teaching staff. So you can like run a whole, a whole operation uh, in, in, in this thing. And, um, you know, I, I know teachers who post on the Facebook groups who say like, yeah, oh yeah, this whole like hybrid or virtual learning thing. Like, yeah, this has been, uh, a, you know, my teaching life this whole time. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's like you were made for this moment. Like, please yeah. share everything, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's funny that, well, I mean, I, this is way tangent. I apologize. But like, you know, we talked last time about the, the book I had written and it was two years ago around now that we interviewed a girl who was being so incredibly innovative and doing this online virtual ensemble. <laughs> and we interviewed her two years ago because like, it had who had heard of such a thing, you know, right, with right. kids. And then I remember the pandemic happened and we're like, oh, huh. it's funny how things change so quickly. Sure, sure. You know, we had to put like a little disclaimer in the book, like this was written prior to... <laughs> the pandemic we still think it's very valuable and wonderful information <laughs> do you want to this seems like a great place for you to promote your book and your youtube series by the oh. way oh oh yay okay sure um so i wrote a book yay, <laughs> yay. Uh, with a co-author um, with katherine finch it's called pass the baton empowering all music students and it's written for k-12 music teachers or or pre-service teachers just giving practical and actionable ways to empower your students and give them more ownership um, in the music classroom. And then what we've done since then, uh, I think it started in the spring, although I, time has like no meaning these days. Um, <laughs> we have a YouTube channel where Catherine and I have been interviewing various people who are doing things to empower their students and who are finding creative ways to give them ownership. Um, and that's been really fun. So we have a new episode that comes out every other week. Um, and actually over the summer, we interviewed Robbie <laughs> talking about one of his cool projects. So that I think is scheduled to come out in October. We like pre-recorded a whole bunch of stuff. So I think October is when your, when your episode should be out. So yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. And it's been like, it's, it's a little bit, I don't know if you ever feel this way on your podcast. Um, it's a little bit selfish because it's like me getting to have conversations with cool people that I want to talk to. Yep. <laughs> it's yep. like, Hey, I want to talk to you. Will you be on my YouTube channel? <laughs> yep. That's yeah. exactly how I feel. Mm -hmm. Totally. It's awesome yeah. though. <laughs> so people should check it out. I'll definitely, I'll link all of that stuff in the notes. So if you're listening to this and scroll to the notes area of your podcast app of choice, you can go buy and subscribe to those things respectively. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Cool. cool. Well, and you know, it's funny, you mentioned the teacher who's like, was specifically teaching virtual, mm -hmm. but I feel though, like the, um, 
the spirit of that kind of, you know, writing, like thinking about student empowerment is similarly, I think it similarly prepared you for last school year, maybe in that, you know, you, the students just had to be so much more independent when they were alone, isolated in a room. And I think that the idea of putting more of the learning in their hands, I don't know, would you say that that helped you to be more successful last year than not? Yeah, it was that combined with the mindset of in order for the kids to have ownership and to, to do that, it has to be meaningful to them, right? Like it has to be something that they find value in, not just that me, the teacher, finds value in. So going into last year thinking, all right, what is a 13-year-old going to feel find meaningful at 7.50 in the morning sitting in their bedroom when they're supposed to be doing band? <laughs> what is going to make that child be like, yeah, I, I, I want to do this I, I, and, and feel like it's something that they want to have as part of their day? So in that respect, yeah, I think it did help going into last year. So what, I mean, yeah, just looking at the past year, I know you had a lot of approaches, a lot of projects, mm -hmm. um, a lot of workflow strategies, technology. Uh, well, <laughs> looking back, what do you, and yeah, I, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna spin this question because I think most people that I know are s somewhat fully back in school. So it's, you know, from my perspective, I'm asking the question, not what just worked last year, but what worked last year that you feel like you're excited about seeing that happen, you know, in, in, and now with a retur traditional return to school, what are some of the things you did last year that were just highly successful and motivating? Um, so the collaborative things that the kids did. Like we had a couple different collaborative projects that the students were able to, um, one of them was like a composition project using a, a Jody Black shop piece and just giving them the time and the space to work together and to create and being able to do it without like, I don't wanna say there was no timeline because you know we're teachers, there's obviously a timeline, but it was like, I, we started the project and I didn't exactly know where it was going to go. And there was so much freedom in that. And it was so, it was such a nice feeling. Like we didn't feel rushed. I felt like if the kids suddenly went on a tangent, it was okay. You know, if they took the project a, a way that I wasn't expecting, it, it was fine because we had the time and the space. Whereas I feel like, you know, pre-pandemic, it was always like, looking at the next deadline, looking for the next performance, looking for the next this. And you were, we were constantly just working towards that next thing all the time. So I think one thing that I liked was not having that same kind of pressure. I, I like the way you just phrased that because I absolutely identify with this idea of having deadlines. Perform, performing arts are so deadlines based. It's like you perform and we know that the process is if you don't fall in love with that at some point, you can't ever be a successful or a happy musician. Um, and we also know that the concert is itself, it's, it's a, it is a part of that process. And the expectation of perfection from it is, um, you know, it's something that we have to contextualize it in this part of like understanding ourselves and our students as getting better as musicians, not as this like, I mean, like it, it is a point where we meet our audience. And so to them, there's this sort of product that, that, but that's how they experience it. And so always trying to contextualize performance as part of this process is important to me, but also hard because there's this very real, you know, you're getting judged at assessment or you are trying to teach your students to sound a certain way. And you don't feel like you've like really taught that successfully if that you don't, you know, whatever, for whatever reason you would feel pressure to sound good by a date. That's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, the context that we were coming from. And yeah, I agree with you that all of these project based things and this sort of like removal of all expectations for musical performance quality mm -hmm. allowed us to move at this really slow pace. And I know that not every, like lots of uh, culture and like industry and human achievement has come from crunching, but, <laughs> but I'm just interested in finding out what we can take, what of that we can we bring into a year where now there are concerts. I mean, I think, had I been going back in the classroom this year, one thing that was already in my mind was like taking a look at that list. Like, you know how you have the list at the beginning of the year, all here, are all the things we're going to do. Right. Like really looking at that list and saying, which of these are bringing the most value to the kids and which are we doing just 
because we've always done them? Or what should we be doing just because we think we have to do them? And maybe taking away some of those deadlines so that we would have room for the other things. Um, and, and that's what I hope people are doing. I've, I've definitely talked to some teachers who that's, they were like, yep, this thing's out the window. <laughs> it was valuable 30 years ago. It's not valuable now. We're not doing it anymore. And instead, we're going to open some room for the, the kids to choose some music or for the kids to do this composition project or things like that. And I, I hope that's what some people are doing as they're going into this year is they're just really looking at what's valuable and what's meaningful and not valuable, meaningful for me, the teacher, but for the kids that are sitting in front of me, not last year's kids, not 10 years ago's kids, like whichever kids are sitting in your classroom today, because they're the ones that matter. Yeah, totally. That's yeah, that's, that's such a good way to look at it. And yeah, I mean, it's the way that I've reconciled my interest in teaching the kinds of musical skills I want to and you know sense feeling some sort of sense that like we have met that goal is you know you can always program easier music like if if, if concert music is the vehicle or a vehicle to which we're communicating the kinds of ideas that we want to communicate as educators like the you can always show more mastery when you program easier music and there's actually is easier always easier music so I so some of the and for me I'm like already thinking about what are those things that I want to die a swift death, you know, after mm -hmm. last year. Um, this will be maybe a weird one because it's not so much curricular or even like related to time, but like I, the nature of being in front of 60 people, like I, I put on, I'm a little bit of like a showman with teaching large ensembles. I just, mm -hmm. I put, I have a put on that I do. It's not, I don't think it's fake or phony. It's just how I, I grip a, a room of people that size. And I think what I, I think I really enjoyed just talking to them through the screen last year because I did it more calm and natural like I do in person. And so one of the things that we have from last school year that we've repurposed is a wireless microphone in our band room. And you, so it goes through our mixer. There's another channel for the laptop, another channel for the phone. And uh, I wear it and it's, it helps with the mask clarity too because mm -hmm. You know, and the mask, it's funny because it's like a little, the mic is a little hot, but the mask is almost like a pop filter. So you get it dialed in just right. And then, yeah, I just, I can turn it off if I need to raise my voice or talk in a certain kind of tone, or I can leave it on and talk just very slowly and calmly. And that's done a lot for my physical and mental health. I don't feel this, I don't feel like that energy you feel after you drink like three coffees and eat no breakfast in the morning <laughs> after I've taught one band class, you know, I've just been mm -hmm. a little more level and I don't know. I just, I just think there's opportunity to explore that side of me and maybe develop using that even to develop better relationships with the kids and just generally move at a slower pace. Mm -hmm. Well, and those, you know, using some kind of voice amplifier, that's also really good for you. <laughs> it's like good for your vocal cords and it's yeah. good for your health. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, I think that's a, a huge win. I was using that when, when we went back in the classroom as well, because speaking, like you said, through the mask and then, you know, the kids were so spread out and this and that and the next thing, it just, yeah. 50 it, it kids, made it better. yeah, 50 band instruments can be playing all at once pretty loud and I can talk in the same style I'm talking to you now and they just can respond to things. That's awesome. This is the other it relates to the other thing that I would like to die at a quick death is like, and I, and I, you know, I'm someone who really does truly believe in the art of conducting and that like conducting is something like even that, that your gestures can influence the sound of a fourth grader who's just mm -hmm. picked up their instrument. Like I, I fully believe in that. I refute anyone who thinks it doesn't matter why, you know, why would you study that or consider that? But that being said, I also think that like, there's no reason that public school education has to like a rehearsal in a middle school band has to look exactly like a rehearsal in a symphony orchestra. Yeah. And some of this technology used last year, it's like, oh, can I, can I get some of those play along tracks to be part of our traditional rehearsal? Can I have video, more engaging video and like visual stuff kind of as a counterpoint to my instruction? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything from that to like the seating arrangement and just the freedom to not be on the podium. Right. That was something that was really challenging last year. I remember, I don't know if you had to do this. We were teaching concurrently at, for some of it. So, you know, I had seven kids in front of me in the classroom and 
15 kids on Zoom and I'm stuck like at the camera. I was like, oh, this is awful. <laughs> I haven't, like, I don't, whenever I was in my classroom, you know, before I would maybe stand on the podium, conduct, and then I was, I was off. I was moving. I was going and, and doing. And so having to like stand in one spot to make sure that the camera kids could see me and the room kid, like, yeah. So that would be something I, I don't ever want to do again. <laughs> oh, I hear that for sure. Yeah. But you have to like kill the idea that like the conductor at the front of it, like that you step on the podium and like the room falls silent. You have to kill that idea that there's like, it's this holy place. Yeah. I mean, I still need their attention, but I, just, mm-hmm. I don't know. Oh, but it's, but then it's so much fun too, to like put a kid there. Like right, who wants to right. conduct this? <laughs> Good. I'm going to go back and sit in the third clarinet section. You conduct. Yeah. They can learn so much from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and in, in my warm ups right now, no one is up there. I have um, my youngest group. I have about um, 20 minutes of pre-recorded warm up, and I'm just oh. coming through the speakers and telling them what to do. And then like, all of the concerns because you know our concert band so i teach our outer two ensembles of four Mm -hmm. so our concert band is you know there's some new players in that group um a lot of questions about how things operate like some you know it's like the about to be the third week of school and some people are still like coming in and sitting in the wrong seat Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know i can control all of that i can you know walk in like high five kids i can fix posture i can answer questions help with instrument Mm -hmm. rental and then the rest of them are just playing that's awesome. Yeah. So that's working. Um, so project-based things. I know you did a podcasting project. Yeah. Um, so, so like the the background for that. So all right, well, I'll go way back. We were fully virtual till March, and then in March we went back into the classroom in that concurrent model. So there'd be a third of the kids in the classroom, two thirds of the kids at home. Then the second half of the week, another group of kids came in. But when we went back in March, we were not allowed to play instruments in the classroom. There were there was to be no wind instrument playing and no singing. Um, but yet I still had to teach the two groups at the same time. And we had 86, 86 minute class periods. Oh <laughs> so it was like, what do I do? You know, it was it was that kind of like, what do I do with these kids for that chunk of time? That's going to be meaningful. It's going to be fun recognizing it's not going to be banned, right? Like one of the things they told us to do, and this was, this just made me laugh and I didn't, they're originally they're like, well, what you're going to do is you're going to give the in-person kids an asynchronous assignment to work on independently. And then you're going to go over to the other side of the room and teach the kids who are at home how to do band. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Have you ever been in the same room as a sixth grader? <laughs> <laughs> like for how long would the independent children still be sitting independently and doing their work you know so like that that to me was off the table from day one I just didn't didn't want to do it so that's where the podcast project came to mind um so my thought was the kids could create their own podcasts on a music related topic of their choice um we, we had iPads that was our device so they would record in GarageBand they could learn about how to use GarageBand for like editing and mixing purposes. They could learn how to create intro and outro music. They, I just kind of came up with like all these different things that they could learn about music, even though it wasn't banned, where they're getting some choice, they're creating things. And then since it's a podcast, um, we were going to publish them. We we're going to publish them on Anchor so they would have this audience, right? So they weren't just like creating this thing that they submitted to me through Canvas that I listened to. They were creating this thing that anyone in the class could listen to. You know, anybody who happened to randomly find our URL through Anchor could listen to. And so it was a it was a neat project in that respect. Um, what ended up happening was we started the project, got the kids all excited, and then the school went, hey, guess what? You're allowed to play again, but you have to do like all of these crazy things and it can only be for 30 minutes and this and that. So the it, it kind of shifted a teeny bit when we suddenly were allowed to play because then it was like, oh, we need instruments and hands as well. Um, but we still were able to, to go through with the project and the kids had fun for the most part. Like I was often listening to them just cracking up. Because, right, right. You know, when you start to hear this 11 year old put on their YouTube voice. <laughs> it was great. Do you, do they do those in groups? So They could if they wanted to, but what I said to them was like, you have to figure out the logistics. Okay. 
because again, the problem was we had the one third at home and then, the, or, or, you know, some of the kids were fully at home. Some of the kids came in one day a week, things like that. So some of them did work with groups if they, again, if they could figure out the logistics for making it happen. Right. Um, a lot of them worked alone just because of that weirdness. It was easier. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Is that something that you think you would do in a full in-person year where instruments are in hands? Um, not like that. Like I've always, uh, I've always really loved the ideas of like genius hour and, and giving kids time to like truly dig into something that's that they're passionate about. Um, Amy Reaver, if you don't, I'm, you've, I'm sure you've seen Amy, Amy Lynn Reaver on, on all the, the social media. She does this amazing Genius Hour project every spring with her band kids. And it's like their spring concert happens in May and then they have some time and she does this, this Genius Hour project where the kids can dive into any number of topics. I could see myself doing it in, a, in something like that, you know, kind of end of the year, we're not playing as much and, and diving into it. Because um, I still you know, band director, butts and chairs, instruments and hands, you know, we want them playing <laughs> like, but it was so cool just to, to give them that space. Um, one of my students who's very, very gifted in many, many areas did this entire podcast about the physics of music, specifically as it related to her flute. I'll be honest. I mean, you know, I have two degrees in music and I don't know what she was talking about half the time. It was so advanced, but she was so excited because it was so interesting to her. So it gave her that opportunity to like do the research and to learn about it and to, and then be able to speak about it, I think was really a good thing for her. Yeah. Were there other projects that you think are more easy to see yourself doing with instruments and hands? Yeah. So the other big project we did uh, revolved around uh, Jody Blackshaw, I'll say peace, I don't know if that's the right word, um, called 13 Moons. And 13 Moons is a set of four composing pieces. So Jody Blackshaw provides um, like melody, harmony, uh, sometimes like a, a counter melody, a nostalgia. She provides like pieces, snippets <laughs> right. of something. And then it's up to the ensemble to turn it into an actual composition, into an actual performable whatever. Um, that was fascinating. Now, when... Jody created it. It was the idea that the entire ensemble was was working together. So the kids would learn like each little snippet and then they would decide how to put it together. So maybe the ensemble would say, okay, well, the flutes are going to start by themselves and then the saxophones are going to come in doing the, um, you know, d doing some like long tones and then the percussion is going to do, so like the ensemble would make all of these musical decisions on their own. Um, what we did last year, since again, like, pandemic, no ensemble, I put the kids in small groups and they had to come up with a small group arrangement of how they were going to do it. And they could use note flight, they could use garage band, they could use whatever they wanted to make these things. And that was another just really, really cool project to see them, you know, just take these pieces and make decisions. You know, you, I was, I was always just like listening and watching what the kids were doing and hearing one kid say, well, you know, you play the bass clarinet and I think the bass clarinet sounds kind of spooky. So I think the bass and like rationalizing why they thought the bass clarinet should do this one particular part, you know, and then another group of like two French horns, I think it was two French horns and two trumpets. They had it in their head that they needed strings. So like they wrote these string parts in note flight and added that into their final arrangement because oh, wow. they thought, you know, I'm getting, um, so, so how do, how do you write for viola? I'm like, oh goodness, are we really <laughs> going to have this conversation? <laughs> but, but it was really cool because that's what they thought needed to fit. So. Yeah. It gets them thinking like that in that mm -hmm. way, you know, about how things are put together. And this is, um, I, I will not like fully be self-referential here only because there is an existing podcast episode um with alex shapiro but she did you know she also has a, curric a composing curriculum for young performers and um that was that was kind of like my composing project of the year with the band kids and this is for those who've never heard of it i'll link out to some information for you in the show notes but the, the general uh, gist of it is that um, you are having students write short melodic material for their instrument recording themselves playing that melodic material and then you the teacher are giving all of these little melodic fragment recordings to the class 
for them to sort of like mix and match together and throw their own piece in Soundtrap. And it, 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 sound, it sort of sounds like there's some differences, but also some similarities in sort yeah. of how you... Well, it's the idea that you're not, we're not giving the kids a score that has every single dynamic marking and articulation and, and things like that. We're, we're giving them pieces or in like in the case of Alex Shapiro's work, you know, they're creating those pieces and then they're making the decisions. And every single time we would do these projects, it's going to be different, right? right. You're not going to have any two versions that are exactly the same mm -hmm. because every time you're going to have different kids who have different ideas and you know, let them experiment. And, and also remembering that like, you know, maybe it doesn't sound good to us right away, but if it sounds good to them, that's okay. Right. We all have different musical tastes. We all have different ideas and, and letting kids explore that is really important. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, the part of me that's, that would be resistant to doing it again is of course, that's the part of me that's like, Oh, but we have these deadlines. And, but I think though that so many of the things I teach, in the performing ensemble environment are actually like longer term payoff kinds of goals. Like the amount of time I spend working on balance and blend and intonation is sometimes makes me feel like a crazy person. But by the time they're in the eighth grade, they are not tuning because they're being told they're sharper flat. They're tuning because they actually hear what being in tune sounds like. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I think that like understanding the scope and narrative of a piece of music and how to play that expressively. I think that that is enhanced when you yourself have to make the decisions of like, mm -hmm. Oh, what comes next? What comes next? What makes sense here? Does this, does it really make sense to include this part after this has happened in my piece? Mm -hmm. um, and by owning that, it gets them to kind of break things apart. I had one student who was like, okay, I wrote, I wrote my melody. I'm like, Oh cool. That actually sounds a lot like this one thing we played earlier in the year. And she says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I thought that too. And I said, okay, well, cool. Um, you're done early. What do you think the tuba part would be like? Mm -hmm. If that is the flute part. And she's like, oh yeah, good question. Maybe it would go like this. And she sang for me. And I'm like, yeah, that's one thing it could do. Why don't you write that? And so now all of a sudden she's writing her own band piece in traditional notation. <laughs> and in doing that, you're giving her tools that are going to be, that are going to help her be musician outside of your band room. Right. And I, I think that's trying to where I'm trying to, I always try to tell myself to go like, yeah, I, I, obviously I want them to be great musicians when they're in the band room and, you know, when we're on stage performing and when we're doing things together, but I don't want it to end there. I want to make sure that when the kids leave, they still feel like they can be a musician. Maybe not the same way, right? Maybe they're not sitting down and playing their Clark studies and maybe, you know, things like that. But if they feel like they can pick up their trumpet and, and do something fun with it, yeah, it's going to have a lot of value. Yeah, totally. Um, before I move on to some segmented parts of the show, is there anything else you want to talk about? The last, the pandemic year review or, or just anything you want to talk about? Oh my goodness. I don't know. I guess the biggest thing that, like my biggest takeaway again from the year was just leave room for the kids to be creative and just leave room in general to, to not be so focused on the concert, the deadline, the score, the, you know, just make music. Yeah. That was well said. Are you, are you good with the, like an app and an album and a tech tip? Yeah. I mean, album is, I've it's got always, somebody I've been listening to. It's whatever. That's fine. That counts. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a, um, a weird person who still in 2021, like puts, decides an album and then listens to it in sequential order. But <sighs> It no, should maybe just be called music of the week is what I should there rename. There you go. People are yeah. always sharing artists or Spotify playlists yeah. or musical they went to last month or something. Uh, I guess I should I go first. So we do, yeah, do, you want do, to do tech tip. All right, we'll do tech tip. Sure. Go for Actually, it. no, 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 no. Cause I didn't prepare this one of the three. Oh. So you have to go first. <laughs> tech tip. All right. Tech tip. Okay. So it's a real, it's a real simple one in, uh, in Google Chrome. If you have not yet noticed the reading list, that's available in Chrome. Make sure you check that out. A lot of people are familiar with their bookmarks, right? And you can bookmark things and you've got your bookmark bar at the top and then you've got your other bookmarks, which by the way, you can organize. Yep. <laughs> oh goodness, this could be like three tech tips wrapped into one. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. So just bear with me. All right, I'm so in your, in your bookmarks bar on Chrome, 
that's the one that just sits right underneath like the URL bar. You can totally customize that. And what I've actually done with my bookmarks bar is I've taken away the words and I just leave the icons. <laughs> so if you go into like to manage your bookmarks, just delete the text or, or, or bring it down to one word, right? And that way you can fit more bookmarks up on the top and keep that nice and neat and organized. So I like the organization. Um, but then the other thing was the reading list. So a reading list is like exactly what it sounds like. It's that blog post that you found and you don't have time to read it, but you don't want to forget it, but you're not going to bookmark it. So you're just going to leave that as an open tab for the rest of your life. Um, so instead, if you put it on the reading list, it's this curated list of things to read and then you can close the tab. Was that too much? No, that was beautiful. All short, <laughs> simple, easy to grasp, easy to implement right now. I have now curated my tech tip of the week and have changed my app of the week <laughs> to be synergistic to your tech well, tip. Then the rest of my stuff's going to be crazy. But okay, go ahead. <laughs> that's, no, that's okay. So I'm going to kind of give two tech tips as well. Um, because my thing is, is like we were talking about Chrome versus Safari earlier and I, so, and I will say that a great, a great Chrome tip that someone on the show shared with me, Katie Wardrobe told me about grouped tabs. Oh yes. So good. You can group, mm -hmm. um, hold the control or the, the command key, depending on your device. And you can click a bunch of tabs and then right click and then create a group. And it kind of like puts a little color coded line underneath them to sort of indicate visually that they are related. And then you can like collapse and expand those items together and it just makes it so much more same like if you have 40 tabs open and like 20 of them are work related just, just collapse them all and then if you have like another little tab like i have a little tab group of music and tech talk stuff that's right. like my website my podcast stats my patreon page all this stuff and boop if i'm not working on that just mm -hmm. collapse them all into one yeah and have you pinned a tab yet as well I, so I have, but I like yeah. this workflow better. Oh no, it, they're totally different things. Like they have yeah. completely different purposes, but like I will always have usually like my Gmail, my, um, uh, my, my Google drive and my calendar are always pinned on the left-hand side. So it just makes the tab a little bit smaller, but it also makes it so that it doesn't close. So if I'm like in an email and I click on something, it'll always open it in a new tab. It'll, I can't accidentally close those tabs. I have to actually like work at closing them. I get what you mean. So, because, so, okay. So they do behave differently. So I do like, mm -hmm. I have used pin tabs and I do like the feeling of grouping them more than the pins. So though I treat the groups kind of like how you're treating the pins is that they're okay. like always open mm -hmm. and they behave pretty well. Like I, they do my group tabs mostly will open links in new tabs. Yes. And yeah, will often should. even open the, the new tab in this group that mm -hmm. I clicked it from which is which is nice so yeah but i just like the fact that you can't easily close it so sometimes if i'm in like a google meet for example i'll even pin the google meet that way i can't like right. accidentally <laughs> i don't know i don't know why i would but you know like i'm sometimes always happen. yeah i'm always holding command and then hitting the w key to close windows that's the keyboard mm -hmm. shortcut for closing a tab mm -hmm. and um I'm, I'm like so quick at doing that that i almost do it impulsively it's like a fidget for me sometimes and i'm just like doing things on my computer and i'll just very impulsively close a tab <laughs> All the it's time. Like, I definitely, oh. I definitely canceled more than one class last year yeah. <laughs> because I'm too comfortable with command W. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So that wasn't actually the tip. The tip was related to that though. Um, Safari I've been, so I've been beta testing iOS 15 mm. on all of my iOS devices because I'm reckless and, but I do it for you, my dear listeners. Um, Safari is getting grouped tabs this fall. It is coming out in, in the Apple event for the new iPhone is next week. So the in, imminently you'll be able to do this in Safari. Um, so that's tip number one, but tip number two is so like, I'm, I'm just going to take a wild guess. Do you use Chrome on iOS? Actually, no. Okay. <laughs> I can't, I can't explain it. <laughs> so here's what, okay. So here's one of the reasons why I like Safari is that because it is a better browser on iOS, like Apple limits third-party browsers on iOS. Like Chrome can't run their full Chrome engine on iOS. They're actually running the Safari engine. They just have designed the experience to look more Chrome-like. So you don't really get anything out of Chrome unless you just like the look of it better. And I really like syncing my tabs. So these new tab groups sync across devices on iOS 15 and you can create little workspaces and 
um, have them just kind of permanently across all your devices. So there isn't this idea. You used to be able to like say, go into this mode where you could like see your tabs open on other devices, but now they're just like open on all your devices in sync with each other and grouped if you have so chosen. Mm -hmm. So I like that. I like that quite a lot. And um, by the way, I'll put out a request. There used to be an app I would use that would sync my tabs and bookmarks uh, between Chrome and Safari. The only way I know how to do it now is that Apple makes a Chrome extension for this feature, but only because only for Windows. So if you have a Windows computer in your life and you open a Chrome browser and you install Apple's iCloud tab, whatever web extension, that will, and you just leave it running in the background, then that can sync your um, your your bookmarks between. <laughs> your, I've thought about taking an old Windows PC I built your, 10 years ago out of the closet just because to do this, you know, because I, I can't stand that when I use Chrome on my Mac, you know, I, and I hop on my phone, it's not there. Anyway, so group tabs are coming to um, Safari and iOS. If anyone knows of a bookmark syncing app, I cannot find one, um, but I'd love to sync my Chrome and my Safari bookmarks. Okay, but that was just tip number one. Tip number two is that you can now change the default browser on iOS as of, I think, a year or two ago. So if you do use Chrome on iOS and you're tired of your links opening, in Safari, you can go into settings and then have it be Chrome instead. You can do it for email apps too. So I use one called Spark Mail. I know some people use the Gmail app. You can have mm -hmm. tapping a link to email someone can open your favorite app rather than Apple's thing. That's very cool. It was really long winded. Sorry. You got me going. <laughs> I feel like you're. I'm in a position of defense with my Safari. Oh, I'm no. talking to you. I'm sorry. I don't mean to put you that way. <laughs> I just get excited um, about the Chrome things. I know. I like. You know what's funny is that my favorite thing about Safari is that I, it is more Apple-y in its design. Mm -hmm. But there are things I actually prefer about Chrome's design. In fact, I would say one of the reasons I like to use Chrome is because there are things that they just that, like I think tabs look better in Chrome. They just sort of look either easier to find and isolate and it handles favicons better, which is what you're, you know, the little, the little picture that is next. Mm -hmm. to the... Yeah. I like it. And again, I get excited when I can share like little things <laughs> that people don't know how to do. I know these are the best things. Cause these are the things where it's like, you know, someone who's, you know, when you don't know how to do it and then you learn how to do it, you're just like, Oh, that's going to save so much. Time. Well, that was like the day that I was listening to your podcast and you talked about, um, the, the link shortcut. Is it command K? Oh, it's yeah. like my whole world has changed. <laughs> Everything. You know, there's one of those for almost every key of the keyboard. I I know, and I should get better at remembering them. And and they're everywhere. Like there's a, a ton in Chrome, and there's a ton in in Note Flight, and then this and then that. You know, but but I just love that that one works everywhere. Like everywhere. Oh yeah. <laughs> it worked in Canvas. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Um, okay. Uh, well, okay. My app of the week now I've reprogrammed to be synergistic with yours. So I'm just going to get it out of the way here. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned read it later. Mm -hmm. So I use a read it later service called Instapaper mm -hmm. and this is not the app. Um, but it's, I guess it's by, I guess it's adjacent to the app I'm going to say. So, uh, so Instapaper is basically you clip a website to it and then you open the app and then it has all of your saved websites you've clipped and then it like eliminates the ads and all of the junk off the sidebars and turns it in. It basically just looks like a black and white newspaper. But if there are images and videos embedded in whatever your whatever web article or blog post you're reading, it, it keeps those in line. And it can save articles offline, so you don't need to be internet connected. And you can do some things with organizing. You can like highlight things and search your highlights. I think they have a paid tier where you can actually send your articles to your Kindle if you have a real Kindle in the house. But what I like to do with it is I've been using it with an app called Readwise. And Readwise is a service that takes all of your Instapaper highlights, all of your Kindle highlights, all of your iBooks highlights, and you can even drag and drop highlighted PDF files into it. And I think it even does favorited tweets. And it takes all of these different sources of you know, where you might have read something and, and liked it. And it sort of like creates like a, a roundup of all of your highlights across all those places and all of your notes across all those places. And then you can search them, but it also dishes them out to you in these like daily emails that says, hey, do you remember when you read this book? Here's like some quotes for you for the morning oh, that cool. I thought were cool. But where it gets real crazy is 
these like craft and obsidian kind of knowledge storage kind of based apps, um, they have a, a Readwise plugin for Obsidian where you can install this plugin right from within the app, and then it'll take all of your notes and your highlights from across all these different services I've just mentioned, and then automatically form like make notes in your note database with them so that they are text searchable across all of your other notes. And even you can link things like I, it'll basically like I'm looking here, I have Suzuki's nurtured for love and it has like made this note with a picture of the book, the title, a link out to it on the Kindle store, and then bullet point list of each note or highlight I did in the book with a link that if I click it takes me to that page in the Kindle app. Wow. It's real cool. Perfect for like when I want to find a quote that I know I read somewhere. I don't remember where it is or what page it is. I can just search Obsidian for some text keywords I may have remembered. And then, you know, there it is. And then you can add your own. It's a note. It's an editable note. So you can like add your additional stuff or link it to another Obsidian note and then create a network of contextual brain knowledge. (laughs) That's really cool. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Obsidian is free, by the way, for those listening mine mine is is goes the complete opposite direction from that so i'm ready so i've really been having fun with kumo space Ah. i know the last thing we all need in our lives is another zoom happy hour (laughs) but at the same time it has it has been cool like the the idea of you know getting together with friends virtually, you know, because of, of distance or whatever has been really nice. So what Kumo space does is it's, it's a, it's a space, right. Um, that uses spatial audio. So you can have a conversation with somebody in Kumo space only if they're standing, you know, their, their icon is standing close to where you are. Uh So it really replicates this is a podcast I can say it replicates being at the bar, right? <laughs> you can talk to the person that you're standing next to, but somebody else can be across the room having a conversation with their friends and, and that can hap- happen simultaneously. Whereas usually you would do this Zoom happy hour and one person talks at a time or, or two people talk over each other and you can't hear what's going on. And inevitably there's always a couple of us who just sit there quietly because... <laughs> Because you know you don't want to be like that center of attention, so Kumo Space gets rid of all that and allows you to have a social gathering virtually and have like side conversations. So I've been using it the last couple months, and we you know we did have like our women band directors conference. It was fully virtual, so we used that for our happy hours. And you can pick what your space look like. So you could make your space look like a bar. And they'll have like little groups of chairs and tables and, and an actual bar. Um, you could make it look like a garden party and it looks like you're outside. <laughs> the one we did in the summer um, was a beach. So like there were big beach towels and coolers and along the one side was the ocean. And if you moved your icon close to the ocean, you could hear the waves. <laughs> and as you moved away from the ocean, you couldn't hear it anymore. You know, a lot of the rooms will have a piano. If you go close to the piano, you can hear it playing. When you back away, Mm -hmm. you can't. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they've also done things just to make it fun. Like I said, a lot of them are bars. You can go to the bar and get a drink. You click on this drink cart and a little glass of red wine appears (laughs) on your video. And apparently now there's like different drink choices too. You could get yourself a a soda or, you know, a margarita (laughs) or whatever it is. They've put little games in there. You could play chess. You could play like code names. So it just it adds it adds something to those virtual gatherings. It's been really fun, and it's free, which yeah. is like mind blowing. It's free. This does not look terrible. I you know I, I'm I'm with you in that. It's like my I when I hear virtual happy hour, I I groan. But this is like very very cute. So my my first glance here is like you, it looks like you can even customize. Like you can build a totally. room, like drag yep. little pictures of chairs and tables around. You can totally um, customize it now. Yeah, it's come a long way since when when I first started using it in the spring. Yeah. Wow. The the yeah, little yeah. drink icons that appear over the <laughs> images of people are very cute. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and they go down like as, as time passes, like your drink empties and you have to get another one. Oh, that's so hilarious. <laughs> yeah. We used it as well. Um, for my college, uh, school of music alumni association, we had a happy hour in August. And I think the funniest moment was when the Dean was standing behind the bar and there were like four of us around the outside of the bar talking to him. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. This is pretty clever. All right, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to try this. Yeah. Because again, like we don't want to do Zoom happy hours. Like it's not the same thing. But when you think about distance, right? Like for me, my family is all over the country. Right. So there's never going to be able to time, be a time where we're going to have a birthday party for my nephew that the family is all going to be there. But could we do 15 minutes in Kumo space? Yeah. That could be yeah. really fun. <laughs> yeah. No, my, my, so every Christmas, my, um, my mom's side of the family that she's one of 10 and a handful of her siblings have three to five kids. So like, you know, I've got like over 30 cousins and between everyone, I mean, there's anywhere from like, 30 to like 50 people at grandma's Christmas party. And I'm just like the year last year we did this on zoom and it's like, okay, there's like 20 to plus different family zoom accounts logged in and just sort of awkwardly like sitting on their couches together in silence while one or two people at a time talk. Right. Um, this is, this seems way better. Yeah. We did the same thing. And when we're all sitting there and like, I just want to talk to my sister. <laughs> Like, that's all I really want right now is to, and, and in Kumo space, we could have, you know, two of us would have moved our little icons across the screen and, and had a conversation, you know, and then you go talk to somebody else. This it's is great. It's, it's cool. And it's, it's a, it's a crazy concept, right? When you're thinking about like, you're all in the same room and, and you just walk over to someone and suddenly can hear them. I'm digging it. I'm, I'm bookmarking it now. Cool. Yeah, and so like right now it's it's free. I think they have like it's free. You can put thirty people in a room, and you can have I think eight rooms at the same time. Um, and you can easily move from room to room. Like picture right. yourself at a, at a party. I right. think they said if you wanted larger, like some crazy corporate event with hundreds of people, that they have paid accounts for that. But like mm -hmm. for what we're talking about, <laughs> this is it's more than enough. Yeah, yeah. This is seems really delightful. Okay. All right. I've I've got to kind of like, I think I've got to move because of eventual kid duties. Um, can we do music? Yes, absolutely. Oh, wait, hold on. My wife apparently just, I got a notification. She left home. So I'm good. <laughs> She's obviously taking him out somewhere. So, she, so you're sure she didn't just leave and the kid is... Uh... <laughs> yeah, like pussing around. Hey, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right. So I have a, a confession. And although I heard one of your recent guests say the same thing, I'm like, oh, I don't feel so bad. I don't listen to as much music as I should. What does um, that mean though? Can we impact I that? I just, I feel bad. Like I'm a musician. I should listen to music all the time and I don't. Well, um, okay. Yeah. I listen to mostly podcasts though. I don't know that that's I That's it. I listen to podcasts. I mean, I just, I truly just drove across the country. <laughs> like We're not even going to talk about how many hours, but I mostly listen to podcasts. Um, and if music is on, I always enjoy it. And if I, you know, I'm out somewhere and there's live music, I'm like, oh, this is great. Um, but I, I don't as often just like turn on music. So, um, but when I was visiting, um, actually, I don't know if you know Taylor Jenkins. He's a good music teacher friend in Baltimore. I was visiting him um, back in the beginning of August. And Taylor is like this wealth of music that, oh, I don't know. So he introduced me to Corey Wong. Have oh, you listened to his music? You steal mine. What's that? This will be so fun if you steal mine. Oh no, is that yours? I mean, I was just gonna say I, I that is what I like had most recently put in Spotify that I was like listening to and just kind of exploring and I was having a blast. What are you? So okay, so he's more of like an artist pick. Yeah, I'm going with an artist pick because again, so what, albums don't work in my brain quite as much. <laughs> but I would put like search for that in Spotify and then and the most I guess the most recent thing I was listening to was. Um, is it Corey and the the Wong notes? Oh yeah, uh -huh. but but just introducing me to this artist who I've probably heard right because he's he's played with so many other different people that I'm sure I've heard him before, but just being you know, introduced by name as like, hey, you might like this. Yeah, I you know it's for that reason I get that like people listening to music on a show about where like music teachers are talking like there's definitely. I think some people do think of like studying music by listening and like having it on in the background as different things. I tend to treat this section of the show as just whatever you are listening to in any kind of context personally or in a community or culturally. I just, I, I group it all. And so it inev inevitably where I am exploring the most new music does tend to fall into similar styles of Corey Wong. So he was, mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he's like, 
you know, just this kind of music, music that's like, um, like loud enough to, that like the, the timbre of everything is going to like punch through the sound of like me cooking dinner. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can like, you know, a lot of groove based music, popular, um, styles of music, things, funk, a lot of funk. He's, he's the guitarist of, um, Wolfpack is one of the projects he's known from for. And there, there are some, you know, they're, they're good fun. They're not the greatest funk band in the world, but they're like a really fun funk band. <laughs> it's, they have nothing new to say, but they are, are good at imitating that, you know, elements of that kind of retro whatever you want to call them sound so and i think that's why i enjoyed listening and watching like this you know taylor's putting the stuff up on youtube and i was like this is just fun this is what music needs to be it just needs to be fun yeah and, and, and cory wong is fun and he's he's uh, put out like over during the pandemic has put out like an insane amount of albums i mean that mm -hmm. wong album is not even that came out literally months ago and it is not his newest album Right. But it, yeah, but it was still this year. Right. But it's, it's just crazy how much he, he's put out at least like six albums since the beat, since this time last year. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, my, my, my pick of the week, I'll just, I'll just bounce off you yeah. and, and stay on Corey Wong. Um, he's got a collaboration album with um, the dirty loops. Have you heard of them? Yes. Yeah. They're like the ones who cover um, pop songs in like a kind of a prog rock mm -hmm. <laughs> or like a few, maybe like a prog fusion, like that kind of like, uh, technical, like kind of like style of like '80s fusion music with lots of like jazz harmony, but also lots of virtuosic stuff going on, and mm -hmm. um, and so they're good. But like, it's it's a great album because Corey Wong, like I don't know, he just he just fits into it in a nice way. It doesn't it doesn't feel like he's an addition to them. It just it just really comes together like a good album. Um, and because of the nature of the songs they're covering, they're all very very catchy. But then there's these like really dense layers of of harmonic and rhythmic. Um, <laughs> intensity that are happening underneath like a Britney Spears song so <laughs> yeah but but it's not ironic it's quite good I mean we've and my favorite thing to tell people it's like the singer is the, you know he does a lot of like higher pitched vocal runs and you know I thought when I first started listening to them years and years and years ago I thought he for sure is using some amount of autotune and to, in keeping with that the conventions of that style but he actually sings all that stuff live you know, he, he, he does it all. Yeah. Um, and that's what's so cool. Like the level of musicianship. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Like what, what they're, what they're doing and what they're getting out of their instruments and, and, and voices. Is, it's fun. I think the album is called Turbo. Or is that a track on the, my Apple Music has been weird. There's like two copies of the album in my Apple Music library. I'm not sure if that's because they released a single first and then I added that. And I don't know. I'm pretty, well, whatever. Anyone who Google searches Corey Wong in the, in the Dirty Loops will find this lovely, cool. you know, collection of songs. So awesome. All right. We're really thinking, we're thinking on the same wavelength this yeah. week. That was, I wasn't sure where, I, I, mean, I never know where you're going to go. <laughs> and that's what's so fun about that. It's like, I listen, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Is that, is that what's fun about it? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I actually have like several of the artists or, or albums that you've picked, like saved in Spotify. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. I, I feel all over the place. I just, I'm editing. I'm about to publish. Um, Joe Playzak is one of the leads of the Sibelius development team. And he came on to talk about their new iPad app and I'm editing it. And I'm just like, I got to start writing my questions down in advance. I just can't get a question out. <laughs> Every question is like, <laughs> starts as a question and then starts to become a statement. Mm. And the only reason you can even hopefully follow along where I'm going with any of them is because I'm phrasing them conversationally. But otherwise, like if you would read the transcript of it, it's like a half a sentence and then I interrupt myself in a half a sentence <laughs> and then I interrupt myself. <laughs> it's just, it's okay. uh, yeah. It's all good. I'm an unprofessional. So um, where, where should people find all of your work? Like blog, book, Twitter, where are all of the places? So Musical Teresa. <laughs> okay. Easy. So yeah, it's either, that's the website, uh, musicalteresa.com. That's my Twitter handle, Instagram, Clubhouse, all the things. Um, and then from the website, you can get to the blog. You can um, find the book. Yeah, you can, you can find it all. And then again, the book's Pass the Baton. And I believe the YouTube channel is called Pass the Baton. It might be called Pass the Baton Book. I can't remember, but I can send you the link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love any links to everything you mentioned today. Mm -hmm. and, and the Clubhouse, is that still happening? Yeah, so um, Clubhouse is still happening. I've been hosting a room. It's the first and third Tuesday of the month at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, 
and yeah, just kind of talking about music ed and, and how we can continue to push things forward, you know, especially in a year where a lot of people are rebuilding and, and all the fun stuff we can do. Yeah. Yeah. What I about love Clubhouse. It still has that energy of like, there's not that many people there and everyone's sort of like excited about using the platform. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is interesting to see how it's evolving and, and, you know, what people are talking about, different ways to use it and, um, you know, everything from how to format a bio to, to connecting and stuff like that. Although I did for my, for the first time, and I think it was two weeks ago, I did my first Twitter spaces. That was interesting as well. Oh, yeah. I was chatting with some other music ed people. So, so maybe that's going to be a thing. I don't know. I'm, it's yeah. It's yet to be told is that the is that a feature or an app like is mm -hmm. it the kind of thing like an instagram story it turns out instagram stories is just everyone stole that idea and that's just a thing that every app does mm -hmm. so like clubhouse's whole thing is like hey we're like this sort of you know you talk to each other in these rooms and then twitter's like oh well now you can do that in twitter and facebook is i know working mm -hmm. on adding that to facebook and you know will clubhouse have its place or will it be more like periscope which eventually was just folded into twitter's own feature set it's not even its own app anymore yeah that's hard to say i mean i do there's a lot of aspects of it that i like um to it there's it's kind of less pressure to just sit there and talk you know that you talk about like the zoom fatigue and when you're looking at somebody how it, it kind of gets exhausting with with clubhouse let's be real you know if it's 9 p.m eastern i'm usually on the couch in my pjs with a glass of wine <laughs> and yep. i'm and i'm having this conversation mm -hmm. and and I liked that. Like we used it for a book club over the summer and it was just, it was a great way to have discussion. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I used it for a book club over the summer. You were in a book club over the summer? I was. And you were too. I know. I, we should Mine have was not. talked about that. <laughs> not at a certain point we should have like, I should have tried to come to yours. I don't know if I knew that you were, I knew about inno innovations and in, the name of the, of the Tuesday thing is innovations in music at, right? Yeah. And it was through that that we did our book club. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. then I did. That's well, that's how I knew because I saw those popping up. Okay. I was just not using Clubhouse a lot over the summer and the spring. Um, but it was my, sorry, go ahead. I say there's just a lot going on. <laughs> there is a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. And I, the, it was with my, so I did a book club with, um, my, the members of my discord in the, which you were a part of. In fact, yes. th th this is where you, I'm just, I'm shamelessly self-promoting myself now. You need to. You should be doing you. So you, and what I do try to mention the Patreon every episode. So you, um, you, this is where you went to, um, ask about some, you know, some Mac advice and um, yeah. hopefully the comments other than the ones telling you to delete Chrome off your computer were helpful. <laughs> no, it was really helpful. Cause again, it was, it was all the, it was the info that I needed. Like, you know, this shouldn't be happening to you. <laughs> and you, like, and you know, if you're doing this, this, and this, yeah, it was exactly what I needed. And it was, it was nice because, um, that's not the co question I would have felt comfortable asking on Twitter. Cause it would have been a lot of advice that I didn't want. <laughs> yeah. It felt like a very safe space to ask the questions. <laughs> oh, I'm glad my discord is considered a safe space. It is very, it is a small group, but if you want to, so I do have a Patreon now and there are different tiers of support. I'm not going to say every single thing that is part of every single tier, but there are some perks relating to like, I go live on Twitch at least once a month. And then I, you know, my subscribers um, can like permanently watch those videos and can, some tiers can even suggest what I cover can even join me on zoom and ask questions while I go live. Uh, can, you know, I've got a whole like backstage access thing, but the very, very, very basic tier. Um, one of the coolest perks it gets you is just, you get invited to this discord server for those who don't know discord. It is just, um, a cool chat app where you join different small communities and there are sort of like different threads of conversation. Some of the threads in the music and tech talk discord are one is about hardware. One is about apps. One is lesson ideas. One is about, um, productivity. One is about Google apps for education. There's one for pedagogy, one for tech support, one for just music notation software, one for music recommendations, and then a couple others. So you sort of like jump into a channel and have these sort of like segmented conversation topics. And it's real fun. There's, there's a handful of people in it. I'd say there's a very, very small handful of people who are very active in it, but I would like to welcome anyone to support what I'm doing, but also to join us on the very fun music at tech talk discord. It's a fun place to be. I learn a lot. <laughs> Do you read? I'm just curious. Cause you're someone who it, who does use it, but like, mm -hmm. you're not like, there's a couple of people who are like daily on it, but mm -hmm. like, do you, you, cause a couple of people who are friends of mine who support the show 
have don't ever participate, but they tell me things that they see going on in it, and I'm like, you you don't have the notifications turned on, do you? Because okay, oh no, <laughs> no, 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 I don't have very many notifications turned on at all. Most of mine are turned off, but every once in a while, I'm like sitting, like, let's see what's going on, and I'll just kind of glance at what at some of the recent stuff. My, so the book club came from this idea of people in the Discord were talking about mm -hmm. Susan Bloom's book, Ungrading, which yes. is a collection of short writings from teachers who have gone gradeless in the classroom. And so we ended up creating a channel in the Discord to talk about that and used Clubhouse for the conversations. And one night I um, was setting up some gear in my studio and uh, I <laughs> squashed my hand with a conga stand like I was trying to adjust it but it was heavy and it like punctured my hand and I was like telling my wife and I was like this hurts ouch and she was like you do have your tetanus shot right and I was like um and she's like yeah you should go get a booster shot so I'm t I can't make my own book club so I'm telling the people in the book club channel do it without me or let's reschedule because I am going to the emergency room and they're like, oh, we hope you're okay. I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And then I start getting texts from a few friends <laughs> who support my show who never talk in the Discord, but they're like, are you okay? So they, so they leave the, that, that, what this means is that all of the notifications, all of the chats in every single channel of the Discord are just like beaming to their phones in real time. And that drives me insane to think no. about. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure all of the conversation in the Discord is lovely. I don't want the notifications. <laughs> I don't even want the notifications. <laughs> like I turn off as many notifications as I can. Yes. Again, because you are a sane person who gives great technological advice. Well, I, I try to be a sane person. <laughs> You're, you are a person who gives great technological advice. There you That's go. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Teresa, it's been good. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for coming again. Uh, you are officially now a regular. Two, that's I don't know. Now that you're, you know, you've done two, I feel like mm -hmm. you can just become. This is the thing. This is the thing. All right, that, I that, like that, it. This is how I conceptualize you. You know, your show regular. Um, anyway, uh, have have a great continued fall, and wishing you all of the success and all of your freelance opportunities in education and. Yeah, I'll catch you soon. All right, sounds good. Thank you. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for this episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to the blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in a podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review the show in a podcast app. It helps a lot. It'll take a second and a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about the show. You can learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash talk. All support tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you a monthly video update with app and music recommendations and tech tips and access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community where you can chat with other supporters and guests about the show, topics, things like music apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be. I hope to connect with you soon. Thanks also to this episode's sponsor and this month's sponsor of Music Ed Tech Talk, Blink Session Music. Be sure to check them out. See you next time.